Uh, good morning. Uh, this week we are going to study uh, one single point by Yeats, uh, which is uh, the statue. statue. Uh, uh, Yeats wrote this poem one year before he died, in 1938. Uh, I think it's a very good poem, but uh, I don't think it's an easy poem to understand. Uh, so, uh, critics interpret it in uh, many different ways. Uh, we're going to read the poem slowly and then uh, I'm going, we're going to read an essay about this poem. Uh, after reading the poem and essay, uh, we will go to the poem itself and uh, uh, do the close reading of the poem, okay? And I'd like to know uh, how each of you will respond to this poem. Uh, you are going to write a short essay uh, about this poem and then uh, uh, you can uh, develop this poem at home and send it, uh, the essay, send the essay to me by uh, Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon, okay? And then I'm going to read the, all the essays and we are going to read the essay together on Thursday, okay? Okay, let's go to the uh, poem. Uh, the statues. The Pythagoras planned it. Why did the people stare? Why did the people stare? His numbers, his numbers, uh, where is the verb? His numbers, the next line, his numbers lacked character. Okay? His numbers, though they moved or seemed to move in marble or in bronze. What does it mean, they? The numbers. Uh, what these two lines talking about is what? Uh, the speaker is talking about a, po a, stat a statue, right? a statue made of what? made of marble or made of uh, uh, bronze. So what kind of statues? Statues made according to the numbers, numbers, right? Numbers. His numbers, though they moved or seemed to move in marble or in bronze, lacked character, lacked character. But boys and girls, Hailed from the imagined love of solitary bears, knew what they were. Boys and girls knew what they were. What they were. Boys and, boys and girls who were pale from the imagined love of solitary bears. Okay, and uh, boys and girls knew what they were. Boys and girls uh, knew uh, that passion could bring character enough. <coughs> passion could bring, passion could bring character enough. Uh, and uh, boys and girls passed at midnight in some public, pl public place, live lips upon a plummet measured face. So uh, when, when boys and girls looked at the uh, statues, they felt what? Passionate, they, they, they become passionate looking at the uh, statues and the pressed live lips upon a prominent measured face. Now oh, you can understand? Yeah. Pythagoras planned it. When did the people, st uh, what, why, why did the people stare? His numbers, though they moved or seemed to move in marble or bones, lacked character. But boys and girls, pale from the imagined love of solitary bears, knew what they were, that passion could bring character enough, pressed and pressed at midnight in some public place, live lips upon a plummet measured face, plummet measured face. No, greater than Pythagoras, for the man that, where is the verb, that modeled these calculations with what? with a mallet and the chisel. So they are sculpture, right? 
uh, uh, model these calculations with uh, with the mallet or chisel. Calculations? What calculations? The the shape the shape of face or the shape of the uh, limbs and, and the bodies, right? So calculations. These calculations that look about casual flash. Uh, calculation that look uh, just uh, casual flash uh, put down put down uh, the man for the man put down all Asiatic vague immensities put down all Asiatic vague immensities and not the banks of ores not the banks of ores that swam upon the many-headed form at Salamis. Salamis is, lo is a place. Uh, 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 the Greek port, port, eh? right? Uh, the banks of wars that swam upon the many-headed form at Salamis. Europe put off that form from Phidias. When Phidias gave women dreams and dreams their looking glass. Europe put off that form. Uh, Europe put off that form. Europe what? Defended. Uh, defended uh, the, uh, um, the enemies, right? Right? Put off that form. Enemies uh, that uh, came by sea, right? Mm. When Phidias, Phidias is a, an artist, a sculpture, Phidias. When Phidias gave women dreams, right? Phidias, uh, boys and girls pressed their live lips upon their face, upon the upon the lips, right? So, Phidias, when Phidias gave women dreams, and uh, when dreams gave uh, gave them gave women their looking glass, looking glass. One image crossed the many handed. Uh, one image crossed the many handed. So an image occurred to many of many of us, many of them. An image. What image is it? One image. One image sat under the tropic shade, grew round and slow. Okay. One image sat under the tropic shade, grew round and slow. What kind what kind of image is it? What is it? Whose image is it? Buddha, right? Buddha. Uh, one image under the tropic shade grew round and slow. No hamlet thin from eating flies. No hamlet thin from eating flies. Uh, uh, there is an image of a, uh, of a, of a cat, right? Uh, in, a, in, in, in the later part, in the, oh, in the last line, Grimalkin. Grimalkin is a cat. Uh, they're saying that uh, cats, cats become thin by, uh, from eating flies. Right? So, so, no Hamlet, no Hamlet, Hamlet, the image is different from Hamlet. No Hamlet, uh, no Hamlet thin from eating flies. A fat dreamer of the Middle Ages. A fat dreamer of the Middle Ages. Empty eyeballs. Empty eyeballs knew that knowledge increases unreality. Empty eyeballs knew that knowledge increases unreality. Knew that mirror, mirror, mirror is all the show. Mirror on mirror. Mirror, mirror the mirror, right? Mirror, mirror the mirror. So, mirror on mirror, mirror is all the show. When Gong and Conch declare the hour to blast, Remolkan closed the Buddha's emptiness. Very impressive, right? Buddha under the tree uh, is in the meditation. Uh, there, is, there is a cat. Crawl with uh, that crawl to the to the to Buddha. Buddha's emptiness. Buddha's he is in in meditation. Right. 
when peers or someone could hold on to each side, so now, uh, this is the last danger, and uh, uh, the speaker is talking about uh, island, island, right? When peers, someone could hold on to each side, peers, one of the rebels, right? Uh, uh, the uh, peers, someone could hold on to each side, calling is uh, God. Someone, this, uh, someone, this to each side. What stalk through the post office? What stalk through the post office? What stalk through stalk stalk through the post office? There was an uprising, and uh, the post office was the headquarters. Their headquarters, the the uh, rebels' headquarters. What intellect? What calculation? What number? What measurement replied? What intellect? What calculation? Number measurement replied. We, Irish, born into that ancient sect, uh, but thrown upon this filthy modern tide, and by its formless spawning fury, wrecked, climb, the verb, the main verb. We, Irish, climb to our proper dark, so that we may trace the lineaments of a plummet measure face. Uh, Okay, this is a uh, very complex poem, and uh, my essay is talking about this poem. Page 153. Okay, uh, the introduction. After. I try to... Uh, Differently, reread the, uh, the statues. Wilson, one of the critics, Wilson sees it as Yeats's worst poem in Otarima, which I refute. Uh, this paper treats the move, uh, uh, poem treats the movement of civilization from Egypt to Greece, India, and Ireland in finest form. It is intentionally Asymmetrical, asymmetrical. It is in fact one of Yeats's finest achievements in his poetic work. In form, says Elman, in form it is like bamboo shoots. Bamboo shoot, bamboo? Do you know bamboo? Bamboo shoot. Uh, he has drawn so many times. Uh, it is like bamboo shoots he has drawn so many times, he has no need to look at the bamboo. Right? If you uh, practice drawing, Painting, drawing, making drawing. Many times you don't have to look at bamboos to make a bamboo drawing, right? So, in content, it is the heart of the philosophical system polished over a long span of life. I also read, uh, read Stallworthy's and Jaffer's trans transcriptions of the pro prose draft of this poem. Yeats did not seem, seem to pay attention to these sentences except for the ideas in it. Okay, uh, page uh, 54, one, 154, introduction. Yeats's, the statue, is one of Yeats's last poems. It was written on 9th April, 1938, and was and first published in London Mercury and the Nation on 15th April, 1939. It is not equal to assume that the, this poem is representative of his uh, last poetic theory and practice. Elman's insight into the characteristics of Yeats's last poetic practice is worth our attention. Like the Chinese artist who paints bamboo shoots for 10 years and wins the freedom of never having to look at a bamboo shoot again, Yeats knew that his long apprenticeship was over and that he had at last learned to his own satisfaction how to write. His mastery of his craft is nonchalant. I'd like to study how the statue was conceived, as well as how it's been read by major critics. I have accumulated a lot of criticism. We have accumulated a lot of criticism on this point, but my essay will pay attention to some major critics' comments and criticism. Based on their interpretations, I will further read the whole poem in following content. I hope I could have broader perspective of this poem and the new objective rereading of the poem itself. 
first and foremost, what did, what did the agent tend to say in this poem? In his last years, he did not seem to have to go back to the poems and rework them as he had usually done. The first approach draft of this poem is therefore important when we want to understand the fi uh, final version of the poem. Uh, Yeats uh, wrote the poem and then he, uh, uh, he went back to, to the poem again and again. So there are many versions, but in this case, uh, not many versions, right? because uh, th this is one of his last poems. Uh, he didn't have to do that, right? Although there are uh, different versions of prose, right? Four versions. Scholars had some difficulty in reading H's notoriously illegible handwritten draft, which is not easy to decipher, for instance. Norman Jaffer's tr transcription of this particular poem differs from that of John Stoll Losses in Vision and Revision Yeats's last poem. I have italicized the variant readings of both scholars for, for an easy comparison. First, Jaffer's trans transcription. They went out in noonday and under the new moon moving with undecipherable, <coughs> only forms in marble, empty faces, measure, Pythagorean perfection, only that which is incapable of uh, show is infinite in passion. Only passion sees God. Men were victors as Salamis, and victory is nothing. Now, one up, then another, only their cold marble forms could drive back to the vague Asiatic norm. Only they could uh, beat down nature with their certainty. Weary of victory, one went far from all his companions and sat so long in solitude that his body became soft and round, incapable of work or war, because his eyes were empty, more empty than skies at night. All men worshipped present deity. Apollo forgot Pythagoras and took the name of Buddha, which was victorious Greece in Asiatic mode. Others stayed away and were made indecipherable and conquered their sublime emptiness and in the jungle nigh they saw indecipherable. Two, there, uh, where are you now? It is better that you share the sunburn and become pale white. Did you appear in the post office in 1916? Is it true that Pierce called on you by the name of Koholin? <coughs> Certainly we have need of you. The vague flood is at is. For from all the quarters coming, come back with your Pythagorean numbers, Jeffers, okay? And the store was the tra transcription. They went out in the broad day and under the moon, moving with a dream certainty. I think uh, this is a better transcription. Empty faces, measures Pythagorean perfection, only that, that which is incapable of thought is infinite in passion. This is better, right? Only passion sees God. Men were victorious at Salamis and human victories were nothing. Now one up, then another. And only those co cold marble forms could drive back the vague as shall cord beat down multiform nature with their certainty. Uh, it is closer to the poem, right? Two, uh, weary of victory, one was far from all his companions and sat so long in solitude. And his once athletic body became soft and round, incapable of work or war because his eyes were empty, more empty than the skies at night. Uh, this is a description of uh, Buddha, right? Apollo forgot Pythagoras, took the name of Buddha, which was victorious Greece in the Asiatic mode. What does it mean? What's the meaning of this? Ale Alexander the Great went to, the in went to India, right? right. Others had stayed away and they saw marble, put forth many hands and feet. Three. Are you, where are you now? 
Is it true that you share the sunburn and become pale white? Did you appear in the post office in 1916? Is it true that tears called on you by name of Kuhulen? So me, we have need of you. The vague flood is at its height. From all four quarters is coming. Come back with all your Pythagorean numbers. Let me try to grasp what Yeats's prose uh, blueprint of the statue is saying on the basis of what both scholars transcribed. Uh, there must be three divisions uh, marked one, <coughs> two, and three. Third, uh, one, division one, first sentence. They went out in the broad daylight, day and under the moon. They went out in noon, noonday, and under the new moon. The two scholars' various uh, readings are puzzling. Why are they so different? But anyway, broad day and noonday, under the moon and under the new moon, it is clear they went out during the day or night. They, in the poem, refers, I think, to the people in general and to boys and girls, pale from the imagined love of soldier bed as well. That is, people stare at the Greek statues, and of them, young, young boys and girls go out at night and place live lips on a plummet measured face. Okay, second sentence. Moving with dream, dream certainty, empty faces measured Pythagorean perfection. Only that which is incapable of thought is infinite in passion. Only passion sees God. Moving with indecipherable, only, only forms in marble, empty faces, measure Pythagorean perfection, only that which is incapable to show is infinite passion, only passion sees God. Stallworthy sees it as one sentence, while Jeffrey sees it as three, but both scholars seem to think that there are three thought groups. Stallworthy, actually only passion sees God is a complete sentence, and the rest is not a sentence, but two phrases containing ideas and images. Moving with dream certainty, what is it? They moved with certain dreaming, certainty dreaming. My best guess is they moved dreaming, certainly with empty faces. Who measured the Pythagorean perfection? Only that which is incapable of thought is infinite in passion. Only passion sheet God seems logical. The measure of Pythagorean perfection, that, that which is capable of, incapable of thought, is infinite passion. <coughs> Does it mean that the sculptures of perfect measurements are incapable of thought, but <coughs> infinite passion? I tend to disagree. My reading, the subject is implied, that is, a Greek sculpture measured and made a face of Pythagorean perfection, which is incapable of thought and which is incapable of infinite passion. However, Yeats believed that only passion is God. That is, that is to say, boys and girls show up under the moon and catch the perfectly sculpted face. That is, only passion is God. But there is a problem with empty faces, which both scholars transcribe. Whose faces are they? The faces of the Greek youngsters or those of statues? Maybe the face of both the youngsters and statues are implied in the final poem, if not in the draft. The Greek boys and girls are not only, not only pale-faced, but also empty-faced, probably because of passion. <coughs> the adjective empty takes another dimension in the later part of the finished poem, meaning enlightened, enlightened, as I will discuss the poem itself below. In addition, Yeats mentions something about the faces somewhere, faces, faces which are divine because all is empty and measured. Third sentence, men were victorious at Salam, Salamis, and human victories are nothing. Now one up, then another. Only those cold marble forms could drive back the vague Asiatic horde. Horde? Horde? Mm. Uh, beat down multiform nature with their certainty. Men were victors at Salamis, and victory is nothing, one up and then another. Only their cold marble forms could drive back to the vague Asiatic norm. 
Only they could beat down nature with their certainty. Both scholars' transcriptions are almost identical, except dry back the vague ashadic chord, in contrast to dry back to the vague ashadic norm. I think chord or rom seems very different, but if the chord is in uh, is in is in transcript, it may look like norm. If it is, it is hoard rather than Stolwalski's hoard. The difference between Stolwalski's hoard and Chaffer's norm produces a total contrast, two opposite meaning. Stolwalski's transcription asks us to read that those cold marble forms were able to drive back the vague ashetic hoard. The Greek statues of art could beat down the ashetic invasion. In the meantime, Jeffers, Jeffers asked us to read that their cold marble forms could have driven back to the vague Asiatic norm, but they did not do so. The former reading says that there was not the Asiatic influence on Greek art, but a lesser reading says that it would have been better if Greek art had received Asiatic influence. While the latter reading is not factual, according to Yeish's comment on this point, <coughs> meaning somewhere else. The variant readings of this part lead to two different readings of the finished point. Uh, point. Four sentence. Weary of, weary of victory, one was far from all his companions and sat so long in solitude <coughs> that this one's athletic body became soft and round, incapable of work or art, because his eyes were empty, more empty than the skies at night. Apollo uh, forgot Pythagoras and took the name Buddha, which was victorious Greece, Greece and Asiatic mode. Weary of, weary of victory, one went far from all his companions and sat so long in solitude that his body became soft and round, incapable of work or war because his eyes were empty, more empty than skies at night. All men worshipped the present deity. Apollo forgot the Pythagoras, took the name of Buddha, which was victorious Greece in the Ashik mode. Both scholars' readings are identical, except that Jeffers is longer than Stolwardis, which is quoted in Albright's uh, the poem. But Stolworthy used the division of this, poem, this portion by uh, 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 second portion, second. While Yeish does not divide this portion, which is important, Stolworthy must have thought of the division's significance. Here, one means the young Siddhartha. Actually, this consists of two sentences linked with, uh, which talk about the uh, Buddha to be. The first sentence is about the Prince Siddhartha. The name means the one who achieves one's aim, who left all his companions in pursuit of his enlightenment, who became a Buddha, the one who is the first awakened being. Stolworthy has succeeded in reading two more words. Once athletic, his once athletic body became soft and round. Now, Siddhartha sat so long in solitude, his eyes turned more empty than skies at night. He is a Greek god, Apollo turned Buddha, an enlightened one. The victorious Greece, which refers to Alexander the Great's conquest of India, which has made a new god, Buddha, in the Asiatic mode. Uh, fifth sentence. Others stayed away, and they saw marble put forth many hands and feet. Uh, others have stayed away, and they saw marble put forth many hands and feet. Both scholars' reading is the same. Others, people, see marble become statue. Uh, part three, portion three. Both scholars read the last section in the same way, that is, the poet wishes to have a statue of Ireland made, pursu uh, made pursuant to the numbers of Pythagoras for his own time. Major readings. Critics have discussed this poem a lot. According to Elman, the statue's European point of view is compared with the Maru's Asian point of view. Maru is another poem by age. Elman and Yeats' shoes opined that Asia and Europe are usually less compatible. Europe could learn much from the East, but should not become Eastern. 
Yeat foresaw a dominantly Asiatic era to come with law thing. In Asia, triumphant, in Asia, triumph, triumph, triumphant, the vagueness and generalization which he had always hated would take on intercontinental proportions. Already in his last years, he saw Lyrician life bent headlong towards the East. The school of Odin, Louis Mac Magnus, uh, heralded an Asiatic era, he contended. For they had thrown off too much, as I think, the old metaphors, the sensuous tra tradition of the poet, and the masterpiece they might produce would be half Asiatic. In the writings of Pound, Virginia Oaf, and Joyce, he thought he perceived the destruction of the conscious mind's in intelligible structure, a loss of conscious control uh, to the point of almost uh, autom automatism. According to Elman's reading of the statues, <coughs> in stanza one and two, in stanzas one and two, Yeats finds the genesis of Europe in the numbers of Pythagoras in stanza two, and currently, Greek boys and girls fell in love by seeking each other's eyes, the beauty of some statue of Phidias. In stanza three, Yeats describes how the Greek sculptor's image of uh, man followed Alexander's armies into India. In the final stanza comes the heroic cry. The poem illustrates what Yeats thinks about the movement of civilization. Untereka, another critic, thinks the statue is complex and that Yeats is attempting to account for modern Ireland and at the same time to reconcile differences between Eastern and Western philosophy. Hans, another critic, Hans a short comment on the statue is not worthy. The statue's statue, the statue picks up one of the threads of A Vision, uh, Yeats's uh, book, A Vision, which recurs again in Under Ben Bulbun, another point. It is the old argument repeated in, the, in On the Boiler, an essay by Yeats, On the Boiler, for the traditional sculpture, the Greek deriving from Egyptian and its measurement, and Alexander's conquest of the East by that achievement. I believe that this apparent obsession with measurement is more profound than any mere numerology, and that it derives, derives from Blake's engraving the ancient of days that hung at woven buildings in which God is measuring the world with compasses of lightning thrust down through the clouds. Compare measurement began our might. And finally, Albright's note focused on idols. This poem is a meditation on idols, <coughs> on God's co-evolution with man as reflected in divine image. As such, it is a sequel to the Indian Pankad, in which the moor fowl sees God as a moor fowl, the lotus sees God as a lotus, and so forth. Every civilization creates an image of God suitable for its needs and aspirations. Here, mankind is not simply the clay molded by God's hand, as a vision and such poems as Lida and Swan may seem to suggest. Here, God is himself <coughs> plastic, malleable to human desire. Peter invited this sort of analysis uh, in his uh, Winkleman. Uh, religious are modified by whatever modifies man's life. They brighten under a bright sky. They grow intense and shrill in the clouds, where the spirit is narrow and confined, and the stars are visible at noonday. <coughs> but more immediate source for this poem was Yeats' study of Indian philosophy. As Yeats re remarked, in an Indian monk, nor can a single image, that of Christ, Krishna, or Buddha, represent God to the exclusion of other images. The statue is indeed really complex, and despite critics' numerous attempts to explicate it, it is still far from fully understandable. I suggest we begin with Elman's uh, hands, an Albright's generalization about this poem, or his last poetry, instead of uh, the explication of statues, because the more we read the explications of the poem by critics, the more complex the poem becomes. What matters when we read the poem by H is 
single image, a single metaphor, a poetic quality of lines, tension between stanzas, the beautiful, sublime, sad, joyful, hilarious, mild, tempestuous feelings. A thesis is, of course, important in a poem, but it is neither straightforwardly direct nor obviously visible. What is more important is, what makes it poetic, whether it is architectonics of form or that of content? The statues resulted, as Elman said, from the fact that Yeats foresaw a dominantly Asiatic era to come with low thing, and that in, in Asia triumphant, the vagueness and the generalization which he had always hated would take on intercontinental proportion. In the meantime, Antwerlaco thinks that the Yeats is attempting to account for modern Ireland and at the same time to reconcile difference between Eastern and Western philosophy. And the third critic hand uh, discovers a key idea that underlies, underlies the point, the basic foundation of the Western civilization, which is measured in the statues. And fourth critic, Albright focus, focuses on the different con conceptions of God in a different species, including man, that the statues has not spoken to each critic in direct, simple language. Fascinates me. Okay, Architect architectonic form of content. The first prose draft is just a rough sketch uh, masterwork is to be based on. Only <coughs> the final version of a poem is to be the object of our study, and I'd like to concentrate on the finished poem, the statues. I would pick, uh, pick it up where Wilson and Helen Wendler left it, seemingly not being satisfied. <coughs> Even Elman seemed to see Yeats's last poetry form as nonchalant, as mentioned above. Yeats began using his favorite poem, Alta Rima, in Sailing to Byzantium in, in the tower and kept creating great poems, Sailing to Byzantium, Among School Children, Meditation Time of Civil War, Parts 1 and 4, 1919, Part 1, The Choice, the Cool Park, 1929, Cool Park in Balili, 1931, Vacillation, Part Two and three, a woman, young and old, uh, part eight, Parnell's funeral, part one, the Gaia, the municipal gallery revisited, the circus animal, and the statues. The statue is the last poem in this form, whose form and content are of great importance, which is seen by Wilson as the worst poem, along with the municipal gallery revisited in terms of autorima. But is it the worst poem? No, it is not. First and foremost, it is the last poem Yeats did in this form. It is not likely that it is the worst poem, as he has already <coughs> written a lot of great poems in this poem. And it is more unlikely that he has made so many unintentional mistakes in a single poem. Wendler, without making negative comments on this poem, observed the difference between this last poem and others in Otto Rima. I agree with Wilson that the statue is now characterized by rhythmical qualities, but neither because Yeats's self-delight in his form, Otorema, had diminished by a process of habituation, nor because this Steiner operation could bring back his first ref uh, refinement of ear. Similarly, I agree with Wendler, who has the keenest ear of ears among scholars, that all the stanzas of the poem, the stanzas are Similarly, asymmetrical in, a re, in, a, in the regular way, irregular way in which they articulate their sentences. And that by making hesitation, the regular use of autorima, rather than repose or steadiness, the characteristic mark of the autorima of the statues, Yeats turns the form on his head. I think there is some more important reason for this. My argument is that once an artist has mastered the skill, he tends to deconstruct it to begin new. It seems to me that the statue is the case. The statue has a shell of his polished, personalized autorema, which is uh, intentionally a symmetrical form, which Wendler aptly calls the form on his head. The poem's content, I say, makes the poem's form stand on his head. The statue's comprises four eight-line stanzas with the 
asymmetrical six plus two formal shell of the orthorema uh, with stanzas one, two, four, rhyme roughly A, B, A, B, A, C, D, D, A, B, A, B, A, C, 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 A, B, A, B, A, B, C, C, A, B, A, B, A, B, C, C. <coughs> stanzas one, three, and four are of three different st statues, Greek, Indian, and Irish statues. Stanza two certainly goes back to the Egyptian man with a mallet and a chisel who had modeled these calculations that look but casual flash before the Greek sculptures. Stanza one opens our short story in the middle. Dramatically, the Greek boys and girls kiss Phidias' statue, plummet measured and fashioned pursuant to Pythagoras' numbers. People stare, empty-faced, at the face of the statue, yet it lacks character. It needs passion and character. The first stanza poses a problem. Why does the poem, the stanza, <coughs> begin with a question, which is, not a very, which, which is not very clear? Pythagoras planned it. Why did the people stare? This can be a recast that. Why did the people stare on it is that Pythagoras planned it. By reversing the cause and effect of a thing, uh, uh, makes the statement highly dramatic, but it seems to have caused difficulty in readers' understanding. One critic says, the first stanza creates no great difficulties once one has decided what, uh, that, what the it is that Pythagoras had planned. Obviously, one reading of, of that, it is the notion of number that makes possible the planet measured face of Greek sculpture. Can one stare at the notion of number? Probably. Probably the face of sculpture uh, people stare on. Line two begins with a phrase. His numbers, meaning that it uh, in line one is not the notion of number, but the face made pursuant to the numbers. Uh, Besides what it means, uh, stanza one is very Yeachian verse, highly dramatic, philosophical, passionate, and with a clear, impressive image of young boys and girls at moonlight uh, midnight, with uh, moonlit midnight, who pressed live lips upon a plummet measured face. It is in Otorima, a lofty fit for the purpose of expressing a strong image picture on the reader's mind, structurally and in content. It is symmetrical, though it may look asymmetrically in terms of rhyming, there are three separate thought groupings. Pythagoras with the, plummet, uh, with the numbers, people and character, in relation to an artwork, a statue. Pythagoras planned it. Why did the people stare? His numbers, though they moved or seemed to move in marvelous bones, lack character. As Elman says, Yeats finds the genesis of Europe in the numbers of Pythagoras and then goes back further back to the foundation of Egyptian civilization measurement. The speaker's opinion is that the numbers are not enough. What the statue needs is character, but the point suggests the corrective passion that boys and girls have. Who know that passion can bring character enough? Thus, the symbolic act of unity of being in art is realized in the last two lines and the boys and girls pressed at midnight in some public place, live lips upon a prominent measured face. As in the first stanza, stanza two, line one, leaves the readers in the dark, nor greater than Pythagoras. It is further emphasis on the first stanza's statement. Why the people stare? Why, why the people stare at it is that Pythagoras had planned it, the face. Who is greater than Pythagoras then? Logically, the artist who modeled the statues. This stanza is also expressive of points of view of art and its history. Art is to look but casual flash. Art is to be concrete, not general, vague. All aesthetic vague emancipates. Phidias promised <coughs> measured art gave women dreams and dreamed their looking glass. This stanza represents the poised defense of the Western art against the onrush of the Eastern in this time. This is also a characteristic of Yeachian verse. A long range of art history compressed impressively into an eight-line eight stanza. 
ending with a brilliant couplet. A euro put off the form when Phidias gave women dreams and dreams in their looking glass. Stanza 3 is continuous in form. Each begins with a key image. Pythagoras planning, planning it, the man with the mallet and chisel, uh, one image with empty eyeballs, and in the next and final stanza, the imagination of Kuhulin, stalking with uh, what Ireland is in need of. Despite the concrete image, the reader is always left in the dark until the last couplet, creating uncertainty, which helps greater, uh, which, which helps gather a dramatic climax. Stanza three is line one is fascinating. It is dual image, like a defocused photo. In fact, it is an image of the statue by Phidias and of uh, Buddha in meditation. It is interesting that the term statue has not been used in the poem, uh, except in the title. In stanza one, a plummet measured face. In stanza two, these calculations. In stanza three, one image. In stanza four, Kuhulin. In final stanza three, the poet defocused the image of the statue to make it dual. One reading is, one image crossed the many headed it means that the statue Phidias had sculpted across the sea, many headed form, to head for India. Another reading may well ask us to see the image of a prince, which many people, the many headed or many people, come to recall. To me, this stanza is the strongest image, which can stand comfortable in balance with what the two uh, preceding standards intend to urge. Maybe Yeats imply that the unrush of the East is inevitably making inroads into the Western civilization, no matter how he is against the, against the march of history. Therefore, the asymmetrical for, formal imbalance of uh, two standards plus one standard is supremely symmetrical in content. My reading is supported by the image, no Hamlet thin from eating flies. Hamlet is representative of the West and the rise of the Western poet, poetics. But the poet declares, no Hamlet, but a fat dreamer of the Middle Ages. Further, the poet declares, empty eyeballs knew that knowledge increases <coughs> on reality, that mirror and mirror, mirror is all the show. Remember, the first stanza uses the image of people staring at the faces, which must be empty faced. The meaning of uh, being empty is not casual or calculations. That is the basis of Western aesthetics. But here in the, in the East, it is key to unreality, which means that it is more than surface reality, as the culprit definitely demonstrates. When Gong and Conch declare the, uh, the hour to blast, Grimal controls the Buddha's emptiness. As illustrated above, this stanza is the conclusive stanza that offsets the, two first, the first two stanzas. And it has to be what Yeats has really intend to argue. This argument is further strengthened by the final fourth stanza. It begins with Pierce. When Pierce summoned Kuhul into his side, what stalk through the post office? This image of, uh, of the statue of Kuhul erected at the rebuilt post office. But the question, what stalk through the post office for, forces us to uh, co-related with the Grimalkin, which is a cat, uh, 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 which summons in Macbeth, Macbeth, and which in the poem caused the Buddha's emptiness. As Albright suggests, Grimalkin represents the anxious, famished intellectual West calling to the full but hollow East. But to me, the hollow East is not that hollow, and empty eyeballs are not empty, but represent the readiness for new <coughs> enlightenment. The poet keeps asking, what intellect, calculation, number, measurement replied? The answer could be, no, we Irish greater than all this. Yeats defines the measurement, the current predicament the Irish are situated in. We Irish, born into the ancient sect, but thrown upon the filthy modern tide and by its formless spawning fury, wrecked. And finally, the last couplet of this poem puts what his disturbed mind has med uh, meditated into his current idea of art. We, Irish, climb to our proper dark. 
that we may trash the element of a plummet measure fish. <coughs> Despite this concluding couplet, there is a strong impression that Yeats is seeing Grimalkin, a symbol of the West, irresistibly crawl to Buddha's emptiness. History marches on, regardless of human wishes and of Yeats's. In closing, the statue is one of the best poems in Otarima, though the rhyme schemes are rather uneven at a glance. The oval structure of form and content of the poem is mostly and represents one of the best performers. Still, critics have diverse readings of the poem, which fascinates me. Okay, we'll take 10 minutes.